Now, uh, because this is a different service, I'll let her slide, but usually we have music going and I want to read the scripture and, and do our intro and all that, but because Sandy's doing her own thing today, she's taking off. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, that's right, sorry. <laughs> let me come back up. <laughs> no, no. Don't ruin it now, you're sitting down. So, the, uh, uh, we're in. Uh, we're going to be in the last week of our current series uh, called Unwrapped, uh, and it's uh, rhythm is all around us. Music has rhythm, poetry has rhythm, dancing has rhythm. But uh, the question is, what about your life? Christmas is a time when rhythm is all around us and inside us. Uh, change, change during this this time of season. There's changes that go on. Uh, and because we're celebrating the birth of our Lord Jesus, and uh, I know all the people were like, well, Christmas wasn't when he was born. Well, so, who cares, right? <laughs> At least we're setting aside time for Christ, right? Don't miss the whole point of it. Uh, and in this series, we, we've been reading, and we've been seeing the rhythm that God uses in the original Christmas story, and we've been learning how those rhythms can be synced up to the soundtracks of our life. And uh, so week number one, uh, we talked about Mary, this, this poor little girl, going about her day, uh, getting ready to get married, and, and then all of a sudden God shows up in her life, and he's like, I got different plans for you, uh, you're going to give birth to the Savior of the world, and, uh, and how she must have, you know, sometimes she must have been full of joy and excitement and, and anticipation, but at other times she had been filled with fear and doubt, because how can I raise the Savior of the world? Who am I to give birth to the King of Kings? And then last week, uh, because of uh, all the snow, we uh, uh, just did a special online service uh, and where we talked about Joseph and how things didn't go as planned. Because Joseph had this idea of, uh, this is, I'm going to get married, this is my, uh, my wife, who, uh, and we got all these wedding plans, but things just ain't going the way we planned. She's pregnant. And it wasn't by me. I don't know what to do with this stuff. And uh, but you know, the angel told, uh, talked to Joseph and and uh, gave uh, Joseph the instruction of how he's to name this child Jesus and what that name uh, means and, and how important it is that, that the Savior of the world be given of the special name picked out by the heavenly Father that his earthly father would have to give him. Uh, and then so this week. We're going to be in Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. As you stand to your feet in honor of reading God's Word. Luke chapter 2. Well, this kind of jacked up today. Luke chapter 2. We will be in verses 5 through 7. Luke chapter 2, starting with verse 5. It says, uh, To be registered with Mary, his, uh, his betrothed wife, who was with child. Verse 6, So it was that while they were there, the days were complete uh, for to her to be delivered. She was about to give birth. And verse number 7 says, And she brought forth her firstborn son. So if it says her firstborn son, how many, does that mean that she only had one son? No. No, right? So, just throwing that out there. Because uh, Jesus had brothers. And the Virgin Mary didn't stay a virgin after she gave birth to Jesus. <laughs> she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Uh, Lord, I thank you for your scripture. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, just speak to us today uh, in a new way. Lord, open our eyes to see a new truth in your scripture uh, today. Lord, I thank you in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Before you sit down, tell the person the next one, you have to be the innkeeper. Amen. <laughs> All right. So this, this innkeeper, so what, what's going on in this story is... Uh, Mary and Joseph, there's been a, 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 a Caesar Augustus has put out a, a deal where everyone has to be accounted for and everyone has to go to their hometown so they can take a census of all the people. And so Joseph was in the line of David, right? 
So he had to go back to Bethlehem, uh, which is where he was from, and, and uh, so he had to take Mary, his, his new wife, and, and to go back to be counted. And while they're on their way back, Mary starts to go into labor, uh, you know, because she's hanged out, she hung out with her cousin for a while, and, and now they're going to Bethlehem, and, and now it's time for her to give birth. And uh, so they're going around looking for a place to stay, because they don't live there, right? They're just going back to get counted. And uh, while they're going around looking for a place to stay, they're, they're knocking on all the hotel rooms, they're going to the Best Westerns, the Super 8s, the Motel 6s, they even went to the Holiday Inn, and no one had room for them. So they come up on this bed and breakfast, right? This is, this is what it says in the Bible. <laughs> they come up on this bed and breakfast, and uh, they knock on her and say, hey, we got a, my wife's pregnant, our donkey's about got a flat tire, we need to, we need to have a place to stay. And the, the, the innkeeper, the guy that's running the, the show, uh, he's like, I don't have any room. But while there was not anything directly written about the innkeeper in scripture, he played one of the most important roles during the Christmas story in the birth of Christ. Because if he didn't do what God had called him to do, if he didn't open up his, his stables, right, his uh, area, his little cave for his... Uh, Mary and Joseph to sleep in, Jesus would have been born out in the street. Right? Jesus was coming. And this reminds me of a scripture where it says, if I knock, will you let me in? Jesus came a knocking on this innkeeper's door. And he let him in. And if it had not been for his willingness to give Mary and Joseph all he had, because he didn't have much. He didn't even have room for him. He's like, I don't have very much. But what I do have, I'm going to give to you. There likely would not have been any place for Mary to give birth to Jesus. And sure, a stable was not the most ideal place, right? How many of you want to give birth to your kids in stables? How many of you think your kids were born in stables? <laughs> Every now and then you look at them and you're like, are you born in a barn? <laughs> this is where that came from. <laughs> so... Right, they leave the door open. That, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? You yell at them, like, what's wrong with you? Born in the barn? <laughs> so, and even though this wasn't the ideal place, but it was all the innkeeper had to give. And we should model the innkeeper's response in the way that we respond to Christ. Because we, when we come to Christ, we don't have much. And in fact, you guys remember a couple of series ago, we talked about our tickets mm -hmm. and what we bring out and what are they worth to God? Nothing. All right. All our holiness acts, all because we pray five times a day and read our Bible six hours a day, that means nothing in the holiness of God. We do those things because we love God, but it doesn't earn us favor with God. And when the God comes up to the innkeeper, he's like, what do you have? I, I ain't got much. Does God require much from us? That we just simply believe. That we accept the free gift that he's given us, right? Okay. And if we, we have to respond the same way the innkeeper does. And when Christ knocks on our hearts, our first response should be to invite Him in and give Him all that we have. Even if our hearts are not perfect rooms for Him to live in, Christ doesn't care. He's like, are you just willingly, are you just willing to let me, let me in? He loves us and desires, He desires, He desires us. Not because of what we did, not because of what we have, not because we have certain cars or wear certain clothes or because our hair is done up a certain way. He just loves us and wants us to let Him in. And don't ever feel like you don't have anything to offer Christ because of your past, which comes around quite a bit. Or just, just give Him whatever you have just as the innkeeper gave Him all that He had. So the innkeeper stepped out in faith. He stepped out. He's like, I don't know. You know I, I got nothing. I got this, this stable. You can, you can give birth to your child there. I know it's Christmas and it's snowing and all that stuff. <laughs> so, but I don't want you out in the cold. Uh, I don't have any room in my house, but you can use my stable. And then while Mary and Joseph are in the stable, Jesus is born. And people came from all over uh, to see and experience Jesus. And nothing was going to stop them. 
right? Because we know the story of the, the shepherds and, and the wise men and all those people. Nothing was going to stop them. And all over, and, and after all this, because all this was promised, all this stuff was God's word saying, I promised a Savior for the world, and it's coming to pass. And they wanted to be close to Him and worship Him for who He is and what He was going to do. Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. It says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judah, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. This is the wise men. So the wise men show up to, to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who was born the King of the Jews? That's an important question. Where is the one who was born the King of the Jews? This is a question that we have to ask ourselves from time to time. Before you come to Christ, you have to ask this question. Where is God? Who is this God that I've heard about? We saw His star, it rose, and have come to worship Him. So what is their, what, is, what are they going to do when they find Jesus? Worship Him. Why? Because they've seen what God is doing in the world. They've followed the signs. And say, There's got to be something more. There's got to be something different. We've seen the signs. And we want to worship God. And when King Herod heard uh, this, he was disturbed. And all Jerusalem with him. When he, uh, verse 4, when he had called together all the people's chefs, uh, chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judah. For this is what the prophet has written. Verse number 6, and the prophet said, but, he, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of, out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out uh, from them the exact time the star had appeared. Verse number 8, he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. Verse number 9, after they had heard the king, uh, they went on their way. And the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over a place where the child was. When they, saw the, when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On verse number 11, on coming to the house, they said, so it's, I'm, not, I'm not here to just jack up your major scenes to situations. <laughs> Are they in the stable? Mary and Joseph. No, they're in the house now. And in fact, when the Magi show up, when the wise men show up, Jesus isn't just born. He's uh, most likely two to three years old. He's a toddler at this point, right? And so, major scenes are awesome. I'm, not, I'm just saying, they're not biblically correct. Uh, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down to do what? Worship. Worship him. Then they opened their treasures, presented them with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been uh, warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. So here's the wise men, the magi, the learned folk from all over. And how many wise men does the Bible say were there? It doesn't say three at all. Right? We only assume three because they had three different gifts. There could have been 15 of them. They all just brought the same gifts, right? So we have no idea how many wise men. Again, not trying to ruin Christmas for you, but just keeping it scriptural. <laughs> So while the wise men may have not been present at the birth of Christ in Bethlehem, as, as portrayed in the modern day, you know, major scenes, it does not nullify or, or lessen their contribution to the Christmas story. Because they had an important part to play. The innkeeper worshipped God by giving all that he had. The wise men show up and worship Jesus by giving to Him. And they saw the star, 
they saw the same star the shepherds saw in the fields. But instead of debating what they saw or wasting time on deciding how to act, their obedience was immediate to the star. Their response was to worship Christ. They did not let things like the length of the journey or the, the struggles that may have endured on their journey distract them from their sole focus of worshiping Christ. Their dedication to worship Christ with every fiber of their being created a desire within them to bring their best, their most valuable gifts that they had for Christ. What was the most valuable gift the innkeeper had? His stable. What was the most valuable gift these magi had? Frankincense, myrrh, and gold. They brought the best that they had. And, the, and this was so amazing. Was one more important than the other? No. God just wants you to bring your best and worship Him. And they would not settle for giving Jesus anything less but the best. And when you worship God, are you giving Him your very best? Or do we show up as we're unwrapping this Christmas story? Do we show up and say, God, it's, it's not about what I bring. It's about what are you going to do for me today in church? How are you going to bless me? What am I going to get out of this? And when you, come to, when you come to worship God with that attitude, what do you get? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> you, get, you actually do get something. You get offended. You get mad. You get irritated. You get frustrated. But because your heart is not in the right place. Because it's not about what we're here to get from God. It's about what we're bringing to Christ. Because He came to give us life. Life everlasting. He's like, this is what I've come to do. I've come to forgive you of your sins. Why don't you come and worship me? And I'll take care of everything else. But God, you know, you, you don't know. The bills are coming. And, and I, and it is, it is, what, you got to bless me. I'm, I mean, I'm your child. Like, oh. Why don't you worship me? I can work everything out. I've already won the battles. I've already won the victory. My blood was already shed on the cross so you can have life and life everlasting. <coughs> Worship me with your best and I'll do the rest. Right? And we're doing a little Dr. Seuss in this stuff today too because it's Christmas, right? <laughs> Worship me with your best and I'll do the rest. Actually, what we should call this, what we're going to name this, this sermon that. Worship me with your best, and I'll do the rest. That's the new title of this sermon. <laughs> Are you worshiping Him with your best? Are you just going through the motions? Just showing up, and this is, this is the, the people that do their spiritual checklist on Sundays. They show up, and, and then they, they well, I don't like that song. I don't like that song. I kind of like that song. So I'll sing it a little are you just going through the motions? Because true worship does not matter what song is playing. It does not matter what style of music is playing. It does not matter what's going on around you. It doesn't matter if the person sitting next to you didn't brush their teeth or put on arm deodorant. True worship, when you show up, don't look at your kids. <laughs> Are you just going through the motions? Are you here to worship Christ? Because He's given us the best gift of all. Does every fiber of your being crave the presence of God to the point that you can't help yourself in, in crying out and worshiping the Creator of heaven and earth? Hallelujah. Are you worshiping with your best? So the story continues. Oh, well, we're going to another part of the story, actually. In John chapter 1, verse 1. John chapter 1, verse 1. Because all this, we got the innkeeper worshiping God. We got the shepherds from the field, they finally come around to worshiping God. You got the, the wise men, they they worshiping God. And this is what this this section of scripture ties right into the Christmas story. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Jesus was with God in the beginning. The Holy Spirit was with God in the beginning. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, all things were made. Without Him, nothing was made that has been made. 
So when Steve Jobs, you know, and started Apple and invented all of like the iPads and all that stuff before he uh, uh, died, but that's a great new invention. Yeah, God already knew it was coming. It's not like God sat up there and went, wow, didn't see that coming. Good job. <laughs> right? Nothing is being created that God has not already created. And verse number four, in him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. Huh. How does this go back to the Christmas story, Pastor? What were the shepherds following? What were the magi following? The light of heaven. The star shining down. Christ is that star. And they followed that light in the darkness. And they're all alone out in the field, surrounded by just pitch black. They saw the light. They followed the light. And the light was Christ. And in Him was the life, and the life was the light of all mankind. Verse number 5, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Amen. Sin cannot overcome us. Because we follow the light. Our situations cannot overcome us. Because we follow the light. And because we follow the light, because we follow Jesus, that means we have life. And Jesus was born in a simple manger over 2,000 years ago for one purpose. To give everything He had, including His life, so that we might find new life through Him. Amen. Jesus was God's greatest gift to all mankind. The gift changed the rhythm of everything for all eternity. Because when you read the Old Testament, there's a rhythm to the Bible. When you come to the New Testament, the rhythm changes. The beat changes. Because all the Old Testament was just the warm-up, the intro. Then the Jesus showed up in the New Testament, and then, then the song took off, the chorus and the bridge. And that's when the music picks up, and it starts to build, and the rhythm changes. That's what happened when Jesus showed up, and God's like, I got the greatest gift I can give mankind. Here it is. Will you take it? Will you unwrap what I've given you? It's, the, you can, it's your gift. I've given it to you. What are you going to do with it? As Sandy makes her way to play the piano. What are you going to do with this gift? Are you going to unwrap it? Cherish it? Or are you going to throw it away? Would you say that you're close to God right now in your life? And I know this is kind of a trick question for all those that have been saved for 130 years. Because when you, when you start to realize, I'm getting closer to God. My relationship is growing with God. I'm learning more about Jesus. The more that happens, the more you realize at the same time you're getting closer to God, the further away from Him you are. Which is crazy, because it's like, that doesn't work. The closer I am, how can I be the further away I am? That's just the way it works with God. Because you start to realize how little we are. How much our gifts that we bring to God don't amount to much. Are you worshiping Him with your life? for what He's done for you. Maybe it's time to make the journey. No matter where you are in life, make that journey to Christ. Because the wise men had to pack up, get on their camels, and make the journey. The shepherds had to pack up, <laughs> guide the sheep and the animals, make the journey. Mary and Joseph had to pack up get on their camel and make the journey to follow the light. And for some of us, it's time to get back to the simple truth that Jesus is the greatest gift that we could possibly have. So what's it going to take for you to get close to God and worship Him with your life?
gets to worship Him. That our Heavenly Father would give His only Son to be crucified on the cross. To be publicly humiliated. Coming into this world as a baby, naked. Being murdered, stripped down in a shame with no clothes, being beaten as an act of love and forgiveness. Say, will you worship me now? I've done all that I've made. I've made this entire planet for you. I've given you this gift. And it wasn't enough. So I give my life for you. Will you worship me now? It was so amazing after his death and burial. God's like, that ain't enough. My children ain't going to die. So Jesus raised, was resurrected three days later and with, through that resurrection comes new life and a power that the same power that is in Christ lives in us. And Jesus overcame sin and death. And because He did that, He's given us the ability to overcome sin and death through His blood. And that's, uh, that's such an amazing gift. And Jesus is, and God is asking right now, will you worship me with your whole life? Because our mission is David. Live like Jesus. Right, we'll stop. Live like Jesus. Right. To live like Jesus. Jesus spent his entire life worshiping God. Doing what the Father told him to do. Then share his love. Christ shared his love for us on the cross. He shared his love with all those he came in contact with. He shared the love of the Father everywhere he went. We live like Jesus and share his love. Father, Lord, I thank you.